Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. This is uh, like Nika said, a waterwise webinar. Um, it's on turf removal, so we're going to cover everything from physically removing your the different methods that are available, options for converting to drip irrigation, plant material, substrate, how to plan the turf removal, um, kind of everything that would include this process. So I know Nika gave a, a brief introduction, but um, my name is Hayden Bernat. I'm the water programs manager here, manager here at Resource Central. I have some pretty extensive background in ranch, commercial and residential landscape construction, irrigation and pump install. And I know Nika gave a, a brief little update about what Resource Central is, but we've had a new couple new people join in. So um, we're award-winning nonprofit established in 1976. And the highlight is we are, our mission is to put conservation into action through our various water programs. So to start off, I wanna talk about, you know, the big picture. Um, why does this topic matter in general? I just have a couple slides on this, but I really like to show this slide because it highlights how much um, the natural landscape and the infrastructure has changed since Boulder in 1870, which is that top photo. Um, all the way to Boulder today, which you can see is really green, lots of trees, but also a lot of turf. Um, and a fun fact about turf grass, it requires an additional 27 inches of irrigation per watering season, which is a significant amount. So um, why are we caring? Why are we doing this? Well, in as you can see in 2000, all the way to 20, the year 2022, um, you know, climate change and population growth has made cities, you know, rethink how they're conserving water. And if you've been in Colorado for a little while, you you know how important water is here and, you know, heading west even more so. Um, so, you know, what can municipalities do and, you know, what can community members like yourselves really do about this? Well, you know, we can transform that or water usage. Um, Outdoor irrigation accounts for, you know, a little over 50% of water use for, you know, any typical single family home. So um, with that in mind, you know, it's it's easy to just say, I'm go ahead and stop watering outdoor in general. And, you know, I won't have that water usage or that water bill during those summer months. However, you know, this can cause, you know, serious problems, including, you know, contributing to the to the heat island effect um, around your home, eliminating pollinators and biodiversity, wildlife, you know, stuff in your area. And it'll most likely increase other bills like AC and HVAC or electric um, due to you trying to cool down your house because you don't have green material surrounding. So, you know, with that in mind, we're pushing, you know, converting landscapes into these zero scape water wise yards, low garden yards, um, and as you can see from this photo, it, they they look really nice, and they're definitely you know worth 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 transitioning into. So for the meat of the presentation, we're gonna have a brief little section about you know kind of what you should do to prep for uh, your turf conversion. So with that, um, you know research is a huge thing. I would you know you see it everywhere. I'm sure a lot of people who are here now see it all the time. I'm just driving down the street, you know, everybody is doing this and, you know, it's really easy to, you know, just go talk with your neighbors or community members and learn about how they converted their space and, you know, kind of see what that entails. You can also ask a professional. So reaching out to local landscapers, landscape architects, local professionals is always a great idea. A really helpful source is the Associated Landscape Contractors of Colorado. Um, you can input whatever service you need done, consultations, stuff like that, and it'll generate reputable um, accredited landscapers in your area. The Really the big thing and what you guys are currently doing right now is online research. You know, find out what people are doing online find resources online. Some of the really good ones are CSU Extension. They have an extensive library on gardening, irrigation, substrate, you know, replacement materials, really anything you can find is there. Um, but then there's also waterwiseyards.org. Um, this is where you can find local people in your surrounding communities who have done pro projects um, and have converted. And what you can do is actually search through based off of your, you know, budget, your skill set, you know, sun exposure for your plants or your yard, um, and kind of look at a lot of different things. And it's really helpful because as you can see in this slide, 
this person hasn't participated in any sort of resource central programs or anything like that, but you know, they've shared what their budget was, what it took, how long it took, the size of their projects. So um, another great resource is, you know, looking at Waterwise Yards and seeing what your community and, you know, fellow um, zero escape enthusiasts are up to these days. So kind of now for the meat of our presentation, um, we're, you know, the first thing I'm going to cover is how to actually find a space and figure out what you're wanting to do. Um, so with that being said, the very first thing you should do is check with local municipal codes. Um, you know, make sure there isn't ready any red tape you need to cut through um, before starting your project. And then, you know, depending on your zip code and where you live, you may be limited to what you can and cannot replace your turf with. So it's always smart to check those out. Um, and then we all know HOAs can be really, you know, kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. So making sure you get HOA approval and, you know, going through those proper channels is also great. But once you get those kind of figured out and dialed in, um, it's time to find the right space. So how do you choose a location? Um, well, first of all, you want to find an area where you are deeming that area as non-functional turf or you want to target unused turf areas. And so what that means is anywhere that you have turf that is not being utilized, it's just simply sitting there to look pretty, um, that is a great space to, you know, kind of convert and change into a zero escape project. Um, you want to make sure you're ensuring, you know, good sunlight based off of your plant selection or your replacement material. Um, front yards are really good. You know that you, as you drive down, you see people with really nice flower beds and it looks really nice and really nice low water gardens. So front, our, front yards are a great option. Um, side yards are awesome. I'm talking about those four to eight foot strips between your house and your fence that nobody uses. It's more of a pathway. Um, if you're able, converting those are great because you can increase biodiversity by having an adaptable or you know low sunlight garden in that area and you can attract pollinators, wildlife, microorganisms, all sorts of good stuff. And backyards can also be great. I'm somebody who enjoys barbecuing, hanging out with friends, family, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, you don't need to get rid of serious sections of your backyard if they're being utilized, but there are sections in backyards where it might be a nice focal point to talk with people about or have a nice area in your backyard for everyone to hang out. So once you find a location, um, the next thing you really want to consider heavily is your irrigation. Um, Cause with the goal in mind of conserving water, you know, you, you, you really want to make sure that that is what is happening. Um, so for people who have in-ground irrigation systems, you would eliminate whole zones. Um, this way you're saving water, you're meeting plant needs, and you're also meeting flow needs for your, you know, different diameter pipe sizes and stuff like that. Um, and what I mean by a whole zone in layman's terms, that is when an irrigation system turns on, all the heads that are running at the same time, that is a whole irrigation zone. More specifically, it is when a valve is turned on and all the heads that are there are running. So from that valve to everything in your yard, those are your ear, that's a whole irrigation zone. So you wanna identify you know, whole zones, that way you don't have split or overlapping zones when you're converting. When you're removing turf and converting to a garden, you wanna be able to convert all the heads in that area to a drip zone. Um, that way you're maximizing water needs for your plants. And if you do have turf you know, around that garden area, um, like you've seen some of these photos, you wanna make sure that the, the grass is still getting the water it needs, that kind of thing. So. You really want to stay away from splitting zones where you're removing half of a zone or overlapping zones where you're removing more than a whole zone with, you know, different types of irrigation. Um, and we'll dive more into irrigation towards the end of the webinar, but um, just something to think about when you're planning. The um, next thing you want to consider is obstacles. You know, look around for any potential, um, like electrical boxes. I know some people in their front yards have the big boxes that come out of the ground. There's a lot of wiring and substrate, you know, ground electronic stuff that can be there. So be mindful of that. Um, you want to check for trees and shrubs, not only for root care and root health and stuff like that, but those will also require different watering needs versus, you know, probably what you're going to be putting in, in lieu of your, in lieu of your turf. 
Um, finally, you want to, you know, avoid steep grades. Um, everything, you know, 18% or over, you're going to have some pretty significant runoff and erosion. And this is because when the turf's gone, you don't have a heavy, dense, you know, plant material that's rooted in keeping that soil in place. So when you get a heavy rain, it'll start to run off. Um, so choosing a flat relative area is, is usually the best bet. Um, so we're going to dive right into the removal options. Um, the first thing I want to cover is area preparation. You want to flag all your sprinkler heads, again, trying to remove a whole zone worth of irrigation if you have in-ground irrigation. Um, measure the space, that way you can calculate how much plant material you need, everything like that, your disposal costs, composting costs. And you want to be able to lay out the space before you start removing so you can visualize what it looks like. I know a lot of people like the feng shui, you know, path lines and stuff like that. So being able to visually, you know, see how that looks and come together will really help guide where you're going to start. Um, I covered it, but calculating disposal and composting costs, if you're choosing a method where you can do that in ground, like solarization or sheet mulching or something like that, then it's not so much a problem, but you know, be mindful of your budget because once you start throwing in plants and irrigation and depending on your removal method, it can get costly. So being prepared for all that is important. So the first removal method we're gonna talk about is sheet mulching. Some people also call it lasagna method, but essentially what it is is creating a composting pile in the area that you're going to be removing. And what this does is creates a wet, damp environment that will allow that grass to die off while also composting and creating good you know, nitrogen rich soil for your plants. So the way it works is you want to start off um, in either the fall of the previous year that you're going to be planting. So if you're doing it this fall, you'd be planting next year. Um, if you're doing it, you can also do it early in the spring, but it varies based off of the weather in your area, what kind of um, process you do, how you do it, and the timeline that it takes for that turf to be fully removed. So you can start fall or spring. Um, you want to cut the grass as short as possible. You can run your mower through it a couple of times and make sure that all that material is mowed down as short as you can get it. And you want to rake all of that material out and you can use that as part of your composting process. So keep all those grass clippings and everything, rake all that out. So you have a, you know, pretty short cleaned out area of turf. Then you want to lay down either cardboard or newspaper. I know a lot of people will probably have questions regarding, you know, ink and dyes that are in newspaper and stuff like that. I would be cognizant of it, but Nowadays, a lot of inks are soy based, so usually it, it's typically okay. But um, it, it, it's really you know pretty easy to do. So you lay down that the first layer of cardboard, newspaper, then you put down a, a good two to three inch thick layer of nitrogen rich rich compost, which can be that those grass clippings. You know, if you have a home compost pile, you can do that. You can also do a soil mulch mix. You can also then just layer soil on top and then put a layer of mulch on top. And then what you want to do is layer it so it looks like a lasagna. And then you'll, once you put down that compost material, put down a new layer of cardboard or newspaper. Again, another two or three inch layer of soil, mulch, and or compost. Then do your final layer. Most people do three to four layers. You don't want to get more than 18 inches thick because as this process is killing your turf, it's also going to compact and decompose and turn into a compost and a good soil amendment. So if it's really thick, it'll take longer. You don't want to do it too short, so only like two layers because then it won't be enough to kill off that turf. That turf may be able to grow up through it. So you want to be cognizant of that. But then... On your top layer, you want to finish off with a good four inch thick layer of organic um, substrate so or an organic mulch. So that is like bark chips, wood chips, shredded you know, wood chips, whatever you have in your area, whatever you have on hand. Put that on top. That way you're kind of insulating and keeping it down. The one thing I, I didn't mention um, that I do want to throw out is you want to moisten the area and kind of get each layer of your lasagna wet 
that way it's creating that cool damp environment and periodically you'll have to occasionally water that area not heavily just run a hose through it every now and then um to help you know increase that decomposition and get that that, that pile down so depending on when you do this process You'll either need to plant in the fall. So if you start in spring and you're able to get it done in that window, you have to plant in the fall. Some people who start in the fall of the previous year will need to plant in the fall of the following year. So be cognizant of that when you know selecting this as your removal method. So the benefits of sheet mulching is it's easy to implement. Uh, I like Amazon. <laughs> I think a lot of people here like Amazon but you can lay down those cardboard boxes that have been piling up in your garage. And, you know, it's it's not super labor intensive, which is really nice. It's cost effective. You can get newspaper, you can get cardboard pretty pretty easily at a, at a low cost. The, you know, there's not much environmental impact. In fact, you know, by putting this down, you're increasing your compost and your nitrogen uh, rich, you know, compost in that area. So you're able to amend your soil. So it'll actually benefit your environment and your soil health a little bit. And another fun little benefit is that if you haven't and don't currently do home composting, this is a great way to kind of get into it and, you know, see how this goes and see how, you know, home composting works. The drawbacks to sheet mulching is you can expect, you know, a pretty lengthy process. This is going to take some time because you're, you know, you're killing that grass over a significant period of time. So six to eight, eight months is pretty standard. You'll have a significant amount of weed growth because it is a cool, damp environment. Those weeds will start to thrive a little bit. So with that comes quite a bit of maintenance. And the other quick little thing I want to mention is it's not super great for steep slopes. Creating a significant pile on a slope, it'll start to slide, especially if you're watering it one day or you overwater, you can get that whole lasagna to kind of slide out. And then, you know, the whole process you've been doing uh, won't work out. The next method we're going to cover is solarization. Um, very similar to sheet mulching. It's, you know, minimal labor, which is nice, but you want to start in the late spring, early summer. This is, you know, usually June, May, June for Colorado. Um, you want to cut the grass as short as possible, clear out all that waste. Um, you can then use that, you know, all those grass clippings, do what you usually do with them. Um, but you don't want them on the area in which you're going to start solarizing because you want every section of that turf to be cleared out so you have no photosynthesis or anything happening. You want this sheets that you're going to be putting down for solarization to be you know, baking every blade of grass, every root, every rhizome, all of it. So once you cut the grass really short, you're going to cover the turf. Usually most people use black polyethylene sheets. Um, you can also use like in this photo, a clear sheets. Black typically works better and a little bit quicker because, you know, a black tarp will absorb heat versus a clear one. Um, and you want to make sure you secure it really tightly with rocks around the edges. So in this photo, there's a brick. That's not going to work. What you need is a probably six inch wide by inch and a half, two inches thick of either gravel, soil, mulch, something to put around the whole edge of your um, area. Because if you have like this brick, wind will catch up and you'll have airlift under that tarp and it won't be as hot as it needs to be. Because unlike sheet mulching, you're creating an oven like effect and not a cool damp environment. So you're wanting to make sure that there's no, you know, leaks where air can get in and allow that kind of area to cool down. Once you cover the sheet, you're going to have to, you know, let it sit all summer, especially during the hot months, which is July, August, and, you know, really make sure that it's cooking. And, um, you know, it, it works by killing the grass because it heats that area and it, you know, heats up that soil and the grass can no longer survive. The other thing I want to point out is watering. You want to make sure you cut off watering to that area. Um, I know, you know, some people do smaller sections. So again, you want to make sure you're trying to eliminate a whole zone worth of turf. That way you can just turn off that zone. So you're no longer um, running and doing that. This process is longer, but it is a longer process, but it's a little bit shorter than sheep mulching and can be done in, you know, probably two or three months. And once it's done, 
you, you know, all that grass is dead and it's loose and it's uprooted out of the soil, you can go ahead and take that tarp off, rake up all that, all that dead turf and um, use that as, you know, either compost or, you know, a substrate of some kind. So with this, the benefits, very easy to implement. You're putting down a tarp and sealing off the edges. It's cost effective. All you're having to do is go buy a tarp. And when I say tarp, you need a sealed piece of plastic. You can't just go to Home Depot or Lowe's or your local hardware supplier and get a regular tarp because most tarps are weaved and there's microscopic holes in it. So it won't be as effective. You need some thick, heavy duty plastic to make this really work. Um, a really big pro with both sheet mulching and solarization is there's no removal. There's no, you know, you're not pulling any material out of your yard like you would with physically removing. So your, you know, your sod disposal or compost is way lower than a physical removal um, method. So um, yeah, another thing is this, this method works really well in high temperature areas. So Northern Colorado, Southern Colorado, where in June, you start seeing those really high temps and they run through September. This is a really good method for that. The challenge is it's a slow process, just like sheet mulching. It's going to take a couple of weeks. It's not, you can throw it down for a week and it's going to be great. It won't work like that. The second con is you are introducing, you know, plastic into your yard, whether you take that tarp out or not, you're still going to have microplastic residue, especially if you, if you have a tarp or a, you know, plastic sheet sitting there for a significant period of time. Um, those microplastics and that tarp are going to break down and that's going to enter your soil. So, you know, there's that aspect. Um, this also will not work with steep slopes and large, like large lawns. You would need a significant amount of plastic and I'm not sure where you would buy, you know, 5,000 square feet worth of plastic. That's, you know, a lot. So this is really narrowed in for smaller areas. It will not work in shade areas. Um, it will also kill off a lot of your microorganisms and can affect your soil health because you are, you know, cooking that soil and you're kind of killing everything in that area. So you may need a full year to recover to get back some of those micronutrients and some of those organisms. Um, you can always amend your soil, put in compost, put in, you know, a good layer of topsoil, that kind of thing. But right after solarization, that soil might be a little rough. Um, the other thing is the maintenance. You need to make sure that it needs to be sealed. If again, if you have air flowing through there, it's not going to be as effective and it's not going to work like it should. The third kind of major removal method um, that we're going to cover is physical removal. So this is what Resource Central uses. Um, we use sod cutters and it's you know really quick. You can also hand dig using use a grubbing hoe, a pickaxe, you know, really whatever you have at hand or are able to rent, you know, in your area, kind of be able to obtain that, um, you can do it that way. So with a sod cutter, it's pretty simple. You wanna make sure you're following all the safety instructions. Um, you have proper, you know, footwear and apparel and, you know, you're following safety guidelines, but you essentially cut that turf and you cut it a couple inches deep enough to, you know, pick up those roots and then, um, roll it up and then you either can create a home composting pile or you have to dispose of it in some way. For hand digging manually, it's exactly like it sounds. You're digging out all the grass in your yard, which can be very labor intensive um, and time consuming. So a couple of recommendations, if you are hand digging, uh, talk to that neighbor kid that mows your lawn and tell them to help dig out your lawn with you. Um, and yeah, you can, like I mentioned, you can do a home composting thing where if you're wanting to remove a, another area of turf over a longer period of time, you can try that sheet mulching method with that compost that you've used from removing this, this turf in the, in this area. One thing I do want to point out is if you are composting with sod, you may not have as much weed growth, but you may have grass growth because you're just turning that sod over and piling it on top. Another thing to probably consider is adding some sort of weed barrier. So we, you know, recommend putting down cardboard and a thick layer of mulch to help isolate that, that grass growth. And it works as a natural, you know, weed fabric. 
Um, another option is to solarize or sheet mulch after. Usually solarize is the best because you can, it'll be done in a shorter period of time. And because you don't have much grass, it's just really, you know, kind of killing off that stuff. So the benefits for physical removal is it's quick. A 500 square foot project could be done with two people in an afternoon if you're determined. It could also be done over a weekend with, you know, one person. So it is the quickest turnaround. You aren't waiting for anything. You just go and do it. And then you are open to planting and kind of moving forward that way. You have, you know, you maintain pretty rich soil compared to solarization where you're killing off that grass and that, and you know, those first couple inches of soil, depending on how you use a sod cutter, depending on how deep you dig, um, you want to make sure that you are leaving a good amount of topsoil and that good nutrient rich soil um, in your area. However, I do want to point out, you know, it's Colorado, if all everyone's front yard is clay and everyone, I mean, some areas are not, but your, your soil is not the best soil. So maybe having amendment is always a good option. It is a, a great way to start a home compost pile. Just build a pile with all your removal material. Um, it's easy to do in larger yards. You're not needing to find a significant number of plastic, a significant number of cardboard and newspaper for sheet mulching. Um, you can do it in a very large area. Another thing is you're going to get fit. You can show off those uh, that uh, that redneck t-shirt burn um, after working out all summer and, you know, for a couple weekends doing this, but that's also a challenge. You know, not everybody is able to manually do this. So that is something to consider um, that it is very labor intensive. You are going to have a significant number of, not a significant number, but you are going to have some regrowth. So that's why we advise that you throw down some sort of natural weed barrier or do a quick solarization run, something like that. Um, you're going to have, depending on the grass and what's in your area, weeds and stuff like that, you may have some really deep rooted weeds. So you need to make sure that you're pulling those and getting rid of those if they start to come up again. Um, the other thing is the cost for rentals and disposals. If you're not going to be doing home composting, you need to find a way to dispose of all that turf. So you're taking it to a local compost disposal facility. That's going to cost money. Your rental is going to cost money if you are using a sod cutter. So it can, it can get pricey pretty quick. Um, these four methods, I'm just going to cover really quickly. Obviously, two of them are going to be ones that we don't promote and I'm just going to explain quickly why not. But like I mentioned, hand digging is always an option, but it's very labor intensive and it's hard to get every root and every grass area because you're just using a shovel or a pick. So it can be really tedious and really time consuming. Um, it is a, a good option if you're determined and willing to do that. Um, tilling is a is a, another really good, I guess, removal method for people who are wanting to explore that. We get a lot of questions about it. The thing with tilling is it's an easy method, but you're going to have to do it multiple times. It's going to take some work. You can't just till once because that grass will grow back and those weeds will grow back even stronger. So you're going to have to till multiple times. As soon as stuff starts sprouting again, you're going to have to till again, till again, and probably combine it with another type of removal method like sheet mulching, solarization, or physically just taking out all that grass that you've tilled. The two methods we're going to just briefly talk about, but more of the cons is spraying herbicide. Obviously, um, there's a lot of evidence and studies on different herbicides. It depends on what you use, but it you know can contaminate water supplies, your soil, your plant health for what you're going to be replacing with, all that kind of stuff. And some herbicides are harmful if not you know applied correctly. They can be harmful to yourself. So. Um, you know, we advise not to use herbicides and that's the, you know, kind of where we're going to go with that. Plus, depending on what you do and how you do it, it can be very expensive. And then the other kind of no-no removal method is neglect. Don't just let your yard sit out. Don't be that neighbor who has a dirt patch with weeds. You you, you don't want to be doing that. Um, this will allow those weeds to grow rampant and be untamed. Um, and it also destroy your soil health because if you're neglecting it, you're not watering it, that soil over time will start to dry out and crack. And for the next couple of years, you won't be able to plant anything in general. So neglect is not a great option either. So
So we're going to take a quick Q&A break and hopefully answer some of these questions. Great. All right. Thank you, Hayden. That was wonderful. So we do have a lot of great questions. So again, folks, we'll get to as many as we can. We probably won't get to all of them. So Hayden, you talked about three primary methods. Do you have a, an opinion or a sense of what is the most effective method between the physical removal, the solarization, and the, the sheet mulching lasagna? Great question. For homeowners, I think if you're able and willing, I would do the physical removal. It's going to happen immediately. You can see where you've either missed and you can do a second run real quick. Um, but essentially, depending on your project size, you could do it in a weekend or two and your project is ready to go to the next phase. If you're choosing sheet mulching or solarization, that's yeah, great because it's no labor. It, it's the way to go for that kind of stuff. But it is going to take a significant amount of time. We see a lot of people who start short solarization or sheet mulching right now and then expect to be planting in the spring season around Mother's Day. And that's not going to happen because it's none, none of your grass is going to die. So you're going to plant on top of the pile or that dead grass and it's just going to grow back. So it's, it's really, you know, dependent on your time frame and how you're wanting to proceed with your projects. Great. So you want it done quickly. You want to be able to plant in that area this planting season, this spring and summer. Physical removal is the best mm -hmm. way to go. Yep. If I'm wanting to maybe maybe plant in the fall or plant next year, I could look more at the sheet mulching or the in the solarization. Correct. So, yep. Okay. Great. Fall planting, following season planting, definitely. I would, you know, push towards solarization and sheet mulching. Yeah, and I'll actually just share that I actually did the sheet mulch method in my yard. Um, a couple of years ago. And I did that. I sheet mulched it in the fall with the intent to plant in it the following spring. And that, that worked for us. So, um, and Hayden, we, uh, we have a couple questions about this. So in regards to when we, you do physical removal, can you take that sod you've just removed and like use it to form a berm or just flip it over? What are the, and what are the consequences of potentially doing that? Yep. So with physical removal, if you're using a sod cutter and you decide you're going to flip that turf, you're going to see grow back in the seams of where you're flipping, just because usually you can't get it tight enough and cover it enough that you're going to see grow back there. So you're going to be fighting grow back pretty heavily. So with physical removal and trying to compost and get rid of that, you're wanting to either yes, an option is build a berm and then you're just mitigating that weed growth that sod growth but you know after a full season if you're not applying water to that area to that berm that grass will die back and you know by the next season you can always add a little bit of soil you can mulch the area apply some sort of barrier so that 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 grass grow back on the berm isn't as bad but then as far as you know actually taking the material off your property and getting rid of it i know there's a lot of places that don't you know, accept sod or, you know, can take that type of material. So you need to look for composting facilities like Resource Central utilizes a lot of partnered facilities that will accept sod. So it's a matter of going back to that first step and finding that research, um, you know, like outlining your whole project, where you're going to put all this. And so kind of going about it that way. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And then uh, in regards to the sheet mulch method, do you have any suggestions on how much the cardboard pieces should overlap? Great question. Yeah. So you don't want to do multiple layers on top of each other because it'll just slow down that decom um, decomposition rate. So you want to at least butt them up. I would have a couple inches overhang in areas. You definitely want to make sure your whole area is covered, but as you're doing the lasagna method, you're going to have multiple layers of either cardboard or newspaper, but you don't want multiple layers on top of each other just because it can help. Um, it can actually, you know, move that water off your pile if as you're, you know, dampening it mm -hmm. and the infiltration air, everything like that, that helps with decompose decomposition can be um, a little rough. Great. And can you speak to how, how successful that is at killing weeds? like crab or in, in different types of grass yeah so so like i mentioned the weed growth with solarization that is going to be your biggest you know kind of pitfall for that removal because you're creating a cool damp environment a lot of weeds will thrive in that so if you have a very weedy lawn i would recommend solarization or removal 
to mitigate the weeds, the best way is to pull them. Um, if you do your pile big enough, that decom decomposition and the method will, you know, outcompete some of those weeds. So you won't have to, you know, pull as many, but it also depends on, you know, what type of weeds are in your yard, how big they are, that kind of thing. And if you, you know, you know, you mow down a couple of big thistles and stuff like that, they're going to come back twice as big. So you want to make sure you're pulling some of those, you know, more serious weeds before you're starting your process. Great. Great. All right, we'll do a couple more here. A um, couple questions regarding this. So when you're doing physical removal, um, we have one question about when you're with using a shovel, how deep do you need to go? And just another general question of how deep do you need to go? So maybe can you speak to shoveling and then how deep should you set your sod cutter? Great question. So it varies based off of yard. I, you know, I can't really give a, a uniform, you should always cut two inches, you should always cut four inches. It's really getting those roots out. Yes, some grass types grow, you know, eight inches deep, eight inches plus. So it's getting as deep as you can without removing all that good material. So for a sod cutter, typically I think we cut three to four inches deep and that will remove all the turf. You won't really have grow back or anything like that. While shoveling, it's as soon as you start shoveling, you will be able to tell where those roots, where those rhizomes are, and you want to make sure you get those out as well. And you're just not taking off blades of grass. So it's just identifying, you know, as you start doing it, you will be able to tell where the grass, the green leafy part of the plant starts and then where that thicker root base actually begins. Great. And then what about negotiating tree roots and things like that? Great question. So for solarization, you want to try and avoid, um, that was on the slide, I should have covered it, but you want to, you want to, um, try not to use solarization on tree roots because you're going to crisp that area and can potentially kill those roots. Sheet mulching, maybe not too bad. Um, cause you'll, that sheet mulch will eventually decompose and become more of an organic material and may help with those tree roots. But for physical removal, we run sod cutters and hand dig as close as we can to those roots. And then once they're a little bit exposed, it's usually using a pick or a shovel and just getting all the grass around those roots out. Um, and that's usually for the bigger trees, older trees where the roots are protruding and you, you know, you can't run a sod cutter or a different method over that. So it's really just getting up close and, you know, making sure you're getting all those little bits out. And as you remove and you'll start to see little pieces that are still there, those really won't grow and spread too much, especially if you're doing a larger area, um, you'll be able to flag and, you know, maintain by pulling those really quickly. Great. All right. How about we do one more and then we'll move forward with the presentation and then do some more at the end. So um, this person is actually doing some physical turf removal. Can they amend and add the soil and plant right away or do they need to try and kill weeds first? So the best bet for physical removal and then trying to throw down plants and stuff right away is to incorporate a, some sort of weed barrier. The best bet would be to throw down cardboard, a good, you know, box type cardboard. Um, it'll, you know, kill those weeds out and then put a thick layer of mulch down. And then what you can do is when you're planting, cut out holes where all your plants are, put those plants in the ground. That way you have a natural weed barrier. Um, and you'll help with that weed growth over a couple of years, you know, three years out when that cardboard is decomposed, that mulch has started to settle. I would reapply mulch and make sure that that area, you know, is pretty heavily covered. I'm not saying six to eight inches, you know, three or four inches will definitely do the trick like a normal mulched bed. But um, yeah, that would be your best bet. If you're really picky about it and you don't want to have to do maintenance periodically, I would definitely try and get as many of those weeds out as you can. But just like with your turf, the weeds are inevitable. There are going to be weeds in your yard. So it's just keeping up on maintenance and then using these proactive methods to keep that, that weed growth down. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Like I said, we do have more questions, but we'll save those, um, get more of those at the end if you want to hop back into the presentation. Awesome. So the second half of the presentation is going to be about irrigation conversion and post removal um, items like uh, plant material, native grasses, and then your substrate or inorganic or organic mulches. So we're going to cover irrigation first. Um, 
I am going to keep it pretty broad for regular residential home um, owners. So if you are somebody who has significant irrigation experience, you know, keep that in mind as we're going through this presentation. So the three things you really need to consider when deciding what type of drip conversion you are wanting to do is you need to decide how many zones you're going to run and what type of zones you're going to run. So as I mentioned earlier, you're wanting to eliminate a whole zone worth of your current spray or rotor system that is in the ground. And you're going to want to convert that whole zone to drip irrigation. Depending on how large your property is or how large your project is, you may want to do two drip irrigations um, systems, one for, you know, maybe larger plants like trees and shrubs and one for um, your, you know, low water, zero escape plants. So zones are a big thing. And then your watering needs. You need to be cognizant of what type of plants you are putting in the ground and how much water they need to, you know, survive. Most low water native drought tolerant plants, you water for, you know, the first two or three years. And then after that, they should be able to survive on their own with maybe a little bit of supplemental water. So keep that in mind when you're planting with trees and with other, um, you know, junipers, shrubs, stuff like that. So with that, you know, deciding how much water you're going to be putting down, you need to figure out how much time you're needing to put your drip down. Normal irrigation zones like spray, rotor, high efficiency zones, stuff like that are going to run for a shorter period of time, but they are going to put out way more water than drip. Drip irrigation is meant to slowly drip over time. And, you know, your run times may be reflected where you're no longer running five minutes, you're now running 15 to 30 minutes but you're limiting based off of your gallons per hour for each plant. So those are the three main things you really wanna think about when choosing your drip conversion type that you're wanting to do. I'll briefly just go over a couple. Soaker hoses are really great for people um, who may not have a current irrigation system in ground. This is something where you can go to your local hardware pipe supplier, something like that, and you can get you know a Home Depot Lowe's, you can get a soaker hose and an irrigation clock that will attach to your spigot on the side of your house. That way you can take it out during the winter and put it back in during the growing season. Um, but you just run it around your plants and that's kind of the end of that. With that, you have Netafin and drip line, which is, you know, pre-built, pre-punctured drip line that has spaced out um, holes on it that eliminate or that put out a certain amount of water per hour, so your gallons per hour. Um, and there's various sizes. So you can have six or eight inch hole separation, stuff like that, and then different gallonage per hour. Um, and so that's a great option if you're wanting more of a permanent in ground thing. There's also a uh, point source drip, which is the most water savings and most kind of customizable and I guess useful drip system there is. You run, you know, three quarter or half inch drip lined through your yard. And then you attach quarter inch or spaghetti piping based off of that pipe, you put it directly to the plant. So as you see on the bottom, there's those colored nozzles. You can actually select the gallon per hour that that, that, that line, that quarter inch line will be putting out. So you can you know specialize for each plant. And then there's also bubbler drip irrigation, which is used for larger plants like trees or shrubs where you may have it hooked up on the same drip line, but those need more water than you know your low waters, your escape plants. So the way you would go about um, converting your drip irrigation is one of two ways. The first way is most residential homeowners, that's the way it's gonna go, is if you have an in-ground system, putting in a drip conversion head like the large photo on the right. What you can do, you can kind of see in the bottom of that photo is you just unscrew the head and you put this drip conversion head in there. Um, it has a filter. It will, you know, it'll work just like a drip system. And then you'll put a fitting at the top, which you can run your drip pipe, you know, to wherever your plants are. The only thing that you need to do aside from put this, this, um, this drip conversion head in is eliminate all the heads in that zone that are not a drip conversion head so you can do that one of two ways either dig it up and put a half inch or three quarter inch cap right on the fitting so where your 
irrigation head sits on the actual pipe where it, the water comes out. You can just put a cap on right there. Or depending on the type of heads you have in your yard, most large brands make a cap where you just unscrew the top of the head and you can put a cap on. And then that way you don't have to do serious staking. The second option um, is installing a drip filter right after your valve. And you are essentially ripping out or eliminating the current zone and then running new pipe through your yard or, you know, having it pop right out and do above ground drip that way. And what that entails is a little bit more experience and, you know, understanding how an irrigation system works. So you would have your valve right after the valve in the bottom right. There's that large T looking thing where you would be installing a drip filter and then you'd be running a lateral, either three quarter, half inch, or depending on how large your zone is, maybe a one inch pipe, like you see in the middle, that black poly pipe. Um, and you'd be running that to your drip irrigation. So like I said, that's a little bit more advanced. So we're going to stay more with, you know, after you do the drip conversion kit, you eliminate all other heads. And then from that fitting, what drip, you know, system do you choose? So like I said, um, Drip lines, either soaker hoses, netafin, or pre-punctured drip pipe. Um, they are also known as pre-built pipe. Um, it comes pre-designed, so all you have to do is weave your drip line in and out of your plants after you get it attached to that um, drip conversion head again. And then another really good thing is that it varies for budget. So if you are somebody who doesn't have an irrigation system or you're somebody who's not wanting to spend significant money on their irrigation system, you can go the soaker hose route where you are just attaching it to a hose bib and you can do a, you know, upgrade a little bit and do a timer on there. So you aren't having to manually water that. Um, but, you know, with that, it can be as complex as you want it to be. Um, you can really get into it and look at your gallons per hour for each of those little holes on the pre-punctured pipe or on the, um, on the netafin, the spacing of them. So you can do like six, eight or 12 inches. The problems with doing a drip line like this is you your potential for water savings is very low. So because you aren't directly putting water right at the base of that plant, you are soaking the ground around your plants, which will ultimately require more water so all those plants get the water that they need. So that's a kind of a drawback. Um, it can limit, you know, your gardening needs. Like I said earlier, if you have a large diversity of plants where some plants need different watering needs, you aren't really able to adjust that. You're kind of just putting down a significant amount of water. So some plants may be getting overwatered. Some plants may be getting underwatered. The next two options kind of go together, but point source drip irrigation, like I said, um, you run a quarter inch or three, uh, sorry, a half inch or three quarter inch black poly pipe, like you see in the top right there. You run that across, you know, probably the center of your of your zero skate bed or your project. And then you just puncture in those gallon emitters like that red one you see at the bottom. And this way you can customize exactly what you want for each plant. They have half gallons, one gallons, all the way up to eight gallons, I think down to an eighth of a gallon per hour. So you can really customize and make sure each plant is getting the exact watering it needs. Once you attach that emitter, like the, again, the red thing at the bottom of the slide, you can then run that quarter inch spaghetti tubing, which is at the top of the point source section. Um, you can run that tubing and stake it right down to that plant. And so it makes it, so you are watering the exact you know, needs for that plant to just survive, which makes it, you know, really customizable and adaptable. If a plant dies, you can change the gallonage. You can move that plant by adding longer pipe. It's really, you know, kind of customizable and, and adjustable for anybody. I really like this system because it has the ability to adjust a lot of, you know, plant varieties. So different gallonage, you know, for each plant you can select and choose how much water that plant is getting right at the pipe. You don't have to adjust significant run times. You would do a general run time and then limit that amount of water at the actual source for the plant, which is really nice. Um, some of the barriers for this is it's hard to install. Um, you need, it's pretty tedious. You are adding little lines to every single plant 
and doing it that way. Um, it can become really expensive. This system requires the most amount of parts. You'll start, you know, racking up that, that, that budget for your irrigation a little bit. And you also, you need to be informed. You need to know how much gallonage, you know, each plant needs and kind of, you know, basing it off of that type. I know a lot of pre-cell gardens like Garden in a Box are pretty uniform gallonage. So you can usually just get away with doing the same gallonage for all of them. But if you're doing rose bushes, zero scapes, trees, stuff like that, you're going to want to make sure you are allocating water accordingly. So similar to point source, uh, micro spray drip conversion. Um, it's the same thing, but instead of attaching a mitter to that three quarter or half inch drip line, um, on the right, that little jet sand stake or that emitter stake you see, um, you just plug that right into the pipe and then you run your quarter inch spaghetti tubing right to the micro emitter, which is that little stand. And then on the top, you can see it's like a little screw. You can adjust and, you know, allocate your water that way. Some of them are fixed nozzles where they spray a certain way um, or they're adjustable like that. So this is really good because it's similar to point source where you can customize what you want. However, you're not getting that really tight point source drip. You are spraying a, a larger area. I would think of it as a mini ir irrigation system in your um, zero scape projects. So, you know, you may be putting more water out than you want to be putting out, that kind of thing. So that, that that's kind of the the pitfalls of this, it's great for veggie gardens. If you have tomatoes, you know, plants, stuff like that, this is a really good option. Um, it can, again, become very expensive, but um, one of the bigger drawbacks to this is the maintenance. A lot of these, because there's no regulator right on the pipe with that drip emitter, um, the amount of pressure that is running through that initial drip line can blow off. And so you're constantly having to kind of monitor and make sure that you're not leaking water anywhere. So, you know, the maintenance on it is, is a little bit heavier. So for um, kind of substrate for your mulches, we're going to cover organic and in, and inorganic mulches. So for organic mulches, um, it's ideal for, you know, moisture retention and soil health. It'll really keep that area cool, keep the water that you're actually putting down, you know, around that plant, around that soil, and it'll keep it in an area where the evaporation rate with organic soils is a little bit higher. So you may be losing some water through that way. Um, it's really good for, you know, shrubs and trees and stuff in part shade. You want to, you know, make sure around the base of that tree, you have a good amount of mulch to again, help with that soil and moisture retention and, you know, kind of keep that water at the base of those trees. Um, you will need to reapply organic mulch probably every couple of years because like the sheet mulching method, it's going to break down and it's going to compact and kind of become part of your soil. So you want to make sure you're maintaining a three or four inch thick layer of mulch. This will allow for one to help with that that weed growth and you know mitigating that but it'll also you know it'll keep your area looking nice you want to make sure you don't use too much like i said earlier you don't want to put six to ten inches of mulch down um this can eliminate uh, this can i guess block and kind of cause a problem with your infiltration rate with the water so when the water comes down, when air is coming down that needs to hit those roots of your plants, it'll start to block it if you have a really thick, you know, section of, of mulch there. Um, a couple types of organic mulch are, you know, wood chips or bark mulch, which is probably the most common. Um, you know, people put that down as a natural barrier, probably four inches thick, and it's kind of like mossy a little bit, so it sticks together really well. So it's good for mitigating that those weeds and stuff like that. Wood chips are really good if you have a heavier wind environment and you're wanting, you know, to keep that mulch from blowing away. You can get various sizes in those and some of them you can get really heavy. Uh, so that helps and it also helps, you know, put in new, good, rich nutrients into your soil. Honestly, all organic mulches do that. But then there's shredded bark mulch. There's dyed mulch, which isn't recommended just because depending on the brand, depending on where you get it, depending on how they dye it. Um, it may cause problems with your soil and it may harm your plants. Um, and then other inorganic options are grass clippings. 
um, straw, pine straw, compost, you know, leaf litter, sawdust. I've seen a lot of, you know, sawdust mulch options and they tend to look really nice. And some of these other organic ones like grass clippings or straw, you can mix in with a inorganic material like pea gravel or something like that to allow for, you know, a little mixture of both while also, you know, kind of keeping a heavier mulch down, which is nice. So with that inorganic in mulch, that's essentially rocks, gravels, pea gravels, you know, anything like that. They're usually very visually appealing. People like the way they look. Um, you can get really nice ones. You can get really, you know, small. There's variable sizes on them. There's different types. There's different rocks. There's all sorts of stuff. So with this, you're going to want to apply it two or three inches thick, not as thick as your organic mulch, like bark or wood chips or something like that. Um, just because it's not gonna, you know, decompose. Once you put that gravel down, it'll stay there for a significant amount of time. Um, it's really, really good for windy areas. If you have super high winds year round, you're gonna wanna do some sort of inorganic mulch. That way, you know, you're just not blowing, you know, inorganic mulch all over the place. The other thing with organic mulch is after it gets wet and you start wetting it down and it's actively being, you know, maintained, um, once it's damp enough, it'll stick together and it shouldn't be blowing as much. There is still that possibility. We see people with that problem all the time, but anyways, um, the optimal rock size for, you know, really efficient inorganic mulch is less than half an inch. So doing smaller gravel or pea gravel is really effective against weeds. Um, and it helps not compact your soil as much, but it also keeps that wind from, you know, blowing away your, your substrate. So heavier rocks and stuff like that, bigger rocks, bigger than an inch in diameter, weeds can start to grow through those and find the sunlight. So if you do a, a you know two to three inches thick of smaller gravel, that'll help a lot. A couple types are you know pea gravel. It enhances water fil infiltration. Um, it acts as kind of a natural weed barrier and is very versatile. You know, like I said, you can mix it in with some of those organic mulch options and really make a really healthy substrate material. Um, there's crushed marble, which, you know, can offer different types of nutrients to your soil based off of, you know, the type of marble you get, the crushed marble, you can get that limestone type stuff rolling through there, especially with the natural decomposed and the stabilized decomposed granite. There's a lot of different options for what kind of nutrients you're putting in. The one thing I do want to say is, you know, each rock in, you know, crushed type of material you use there will be different types of nutrients based off of the minerals that are in that rock. So just be cognizant of like, don't put too much of something in, maybe mix it up a little bit. But then there's stuff like Mexican beach pebble or lava rocks or smooth river rocks that look really nice. Um, and they're a little bit bigger, but people do um, little drain flows and stuff through their yards all the time. And it, those look really nice through there too. So a couple uh, inorganic mulch options for you. Next, we're going to cover some plant materials. So zero scape grass is, you know, a, a huge thing that people are trying to get into is native grass. I only threw a couple on here, um, but blue grama, I want to note specifically, is a really good kind of lighter native grass. Um, big blue stem is kind of what you see in the prairies. It's a little bit thicker and, you know, has kind of more of a bunch on it. And so those may be good for side yards and stuff like that. Buffalo grass is a good, you know, kind of turf-like alternative. Um, it'll gray in the summer, you know, it's that that's how native grasses work. But um, it's more of a low growing. It is kind of the prickier grass, so it's maybe not used for like running around on. But blue grama is a, is a good alternative for um, a native grass as well. You can actually mow that down a couple times a year and you know, don't mow it every week like you would your normal turf, but if you mow it down a couple of times, it'll help with that um, aesthetic and kind of make it look a little bit more, you know, turf-like if that's what you're after. Typically, the native grass conversion is for larger projects and stuff like that, where planting, you know, smaller water-wise plants may not be the option just due to cost and stuff like that and maintenance. So those are a couple of native grass options, but um, there are a lot of, lot of different low water, either native or, you know, tolerable plants for Colorado and, you know, sedum, um, large ornamental grasses are really good. Um, if you do a huge bunch, you know, 
little blue stem or big blue stem that way that can look really nice um sage primrose penstemon um you know yarrow is really nice there's a lot of different plants that you are able to you know mix and match and make a really nice garden so th this webinar is definitely not to promote certain programs of resource central by any means i am going to note that the garden in a box store if you go there you will get plant lists for, you know, specific watering needs and stuff like that. So it may be a good resource for you. That way you can, you know, decide, I really like this plant. This is how much water it needs. And then go to your local nursery or greenhouse and, you know, pick up a, a good chunk of those and, you know, kind of plan your own garden that way. So that's the tag, the little tag I'm going to do about um, garden in a box. But for turf removal, if, you know, starting your project, physically removing the turf is too much for you. We do offer a turf removal service, but um, again, this webinar is meant to inform you guys on different removal methods. So with that in mind, I'll turn it back over to questions and hopefully be able to help you guys out with some of some of your more specific questions. Great. Thanks, Hayden. That was wonderful. All right. So again, we'll get as many of these we can, as we can, folks. So I know you just talked about some different types of grasses. Do you have any recommendations if they want to get rid of, like, say, their Kentucky bluegrass, uh, but still want to have something that is lawn-like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so blue grama and um, certain types of buffalo grasses, you can get low-growing ones where they will seed and they'll have the little, like, native grass look to them. But like I said, if you mow them down um, once or twice a year, you can continue to have kind of that that, that grass and turf like quality however again the texture won't be the same it won't be green during the summers you know that type of thing but it is a good option for kind of those cooler off seasons where you're looking for more of a green grass type type layout great all right fantastic and then i don't know if you've peeked at these questions yet uh, are you familiar at all with using clover as a ground cover clover is a, a great option it's it, it's you know it is a water wise plant the only thing is clover is also invasive and it takes over really quickly. So it's hard to contain in your removal area. So if you're planting a whole section with clover, you may find that you have clover, you know, going all over the place. So having some sort of edging or barrier to help, you know, mitigate that might be a good option. But clover has been, you know, something people ask quite a bit about. And it is an option. It is a green, you know, water-wise plant material. It doesn't take much water. Um, but you will find, you know, once it blooms and it, it's looking nice, you may see the clover just taking over everywhere. So be cognizant of that. Great. All right. So we're going to jump around here a little bit because there were some questions about kind of the sheet mulching and stuff that we didn't get to before. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, if the grass has already arisen above the level of the sidewalk, mm -hmm. is what, how, how do you get rid of that turf? So, I, I mean, I, I think I know what they're talking about. So, you know, you're, you're, you have a kind of a mound, your sidewalk, and then an immediate mound of grass. If you're wanting to get rid of that, is physical removal the best, sheet mulching, solarization? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, physical removal, um, especially around the edges, you know, running a sod cutter there won't cut it as deep. So I would, you know, not trench out an area, but definitely dig it deep enough so you're getting back to that at that level and then kind of trying to, I guess, grade it to that level as close as possible with physical removal um, would be good. If you use solarization or sheet mulching, with sheet mulching, you are adding material to your yard so that hill or that mound will only increase. If you're using solarization, you're only killing essentially the grass, all that dirt will still be there. So physical removal is kind of the only way to get rid of that barrier. I would also look into, you know, maybe thatching your yard or trying to pull it out because sometimes we see those barriers or that, that raised turf and it's just from people using either not bagging or properly cross cutting their yards where that thatch is going to build really high and that roots are, you know, are going to climb as that those grass clippings start to sit on there. So maybe dethatching and pulling out some of that stuff could be really beneficial as well. Can you speak a little bit more about thatching? Um, we do have another question about that. Just like what is thatch and how how do you get rid of it? Yeah, great question. So thatch kind of there's two folds to it. Sometimes it is just grass laying on top of each other that other grass has grown over and you can no longer, you know, 
see the soil or spread grass apart and it creates, it starts to pile up and create a thicker barrier. The more common term for thatch is when that is happening, your roots will actually start to grow higher and kind of turn your organic clippings kind of into a soil substrate and your roots will get really thick. And that is a, you know, serious thatch thing where when that, that, that root has risen above again, a, a sidewalk line or wherever it's at, you need to come in with a, either a heavy rake. They make things called dethatchers where you pull it through your yard and it will rip out those, you know, excessive roots or those excessive clippings and help kind of clear it out so your turf can, you know, fill that space like it normally would. But again, with removal, um, if you're not wanting to, you know, remove certain sections of that or turf that's on your sidewalk, thatching may be an option. But as far as removal goes, just physically removing would definitely be the best option to deal with that type of Great. problem. So if I'm going to do physical removal, I don't even need to worry about dethatching first. Correct. Okay. Great. All right. All right. Um, you might have referenced this back during the solarization part, but um, do you have any suggestions on the type of plastic or where to buy it? Great question. Um, I I I don't think we are allowed to promote any singular profitable business, so I don't have any specific names for anybody. However, um, the type you are gonna want to look for some sort of black polyethylene plastic. Again, it needs to be you know like if you have those heavy duty um trash bags like that you collect leaves and stuff in those yard trash bags those can tend to be you know useful um but you know again you you would run into a ceiling problem because those are only so big you can't cover a whole space with it so it has to be that type of material again you can also use clear but yeah as far as recommending where we get you know stuff like that um, I would definitely, you know, contact your local hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, stuff like that, bigger commercial, you know, facilities that have, you know, a wide variety of products like that. Great. All right. So we have another question about sheet mulching. So what happens if you plant immediately after sheet mulching? Um, your plants will probably take for the first year and then as that soil's decomposing, those roots are gonna grow down and eventually get to your soil, but then you're gonna have a weird mound where your plants are sitting and your, um, I guess your soil or your, you know, your grade for your yard is gonna be way lower than your plants. So the recommendation is, is once that stuff, you know, decomposes and breaks down the sheet mulching process, either, you know, amend your soil in by either tilling it in a little bit mixing it in with that that top soil that you you know of the grass you just killed in that area and then plant on top of that if you plant on top i you know i i guess i've never seen that happen or seen you know the results of it but um i don't see it going well long term you may just start building a pile and then you end up with the sidewalk problem where your yard is higher than your grade yeah and um we actually have a kind of maybe a related question here about this person saying if they do the sheet mulch in the fall and then plant in the spring. Has the cardboard broken down enough or what do you do about the cardboard? Yeah, great question. Um, ideally, sheet mulching is something you, would, you wouldn't be taking anything out. Um, you can take out that, that cardboard and stuff like that if your grass is dead and you're like, okay, it's dead. I'm good to go. You know, that may be an option. However, because it is such a long project, excuse me, such as, because it is such a long, long project, um, your cardboard will most likely not be broken down unless you live in an area where the climate can support, you know, you have warmer weather, you're doing all the steps right, you're, you know, moistening that area, that kind of thing. Um, you can usually start planting by fall. And that, that, you know, because as you moisten it a little bit, that cardboard is going to get wet and soggy and it's going to break down pretty quickly. Um, but it's a matter of the turf being gone is what you need to be mindful of when, you know, trying to plant in that same year's fall. Yeah. And I can actually speak to that from personal experience. As I mentioned before, I, I did that. I did the sheet mulching in the fall and then planted the next spring. And there were areas where the cardboard wasn't all the way broken down and we just dug through it. Mm -hmm. We just made a hole. Yep. So. Yeah, exactly. Just like doing a, a natural barrier that way. Exactly. It's safe. Yep. Yeah, and we do have a question about weed barriers. 
So I know I have my personal thoughts on this, but I'll get your opinion first, Hayden, about kind of those off the shelf weed barriers that you would buy, say, at a hardware store. Do you have any, mm -hmm. you know, what are what are the advantages and disadvantages to those? Yeah, so using plastic weed barriers, obviously you're introducing my micro microplastics into your yard. The other thing is, is after about a year or two, that weed fabric is going to also break down. It takes longer to break down than cardboard and stuff like that, but it's not a sure way. Like you can't just put down weed fabric and then never have weeds. You're going to have to amend it anyway. So doing an option like cardboard where you're not only contributing to your soil, but it's also an easier application and it's, you know, good for your soil is the best bet versus using, you know, a weed fabric base. Plus, depending on how you apply it, you know, and the, the ways you use it, you may start suffocating your plants. Again, that's the problem with doing multiple layers of cardboard on a sheet mulch or as a natural reed barrier is you'll suffocate those plants. They may not, you know, water may not infiltrate through there. So, you know, steering away from, you know, weed fabric and plastic fabric and stuff like that is probably a better bet. Um, again, you know, your prerogative, but that's kind of the, the, the way, it, you know, I view it. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of been my, my experience and, and feedback on it as well. Uh -huh. All right. So in, getting back to solarization, do you know whether or not it kills bindweed? <laughs> <laughs> bindweed is bindweed and it's, it is hard to kill. Um, if you are able to seal your area and really fry that, you know, all that area and, um, you know, kind of kill that soil, essentially not kill it. You'll still have good quality to a degree afterwards um most of that bindweed should be gone but if you have airflow coming in there that bindweed will go rampant and that's why sealing it is so important um but you may also have to be digging out some bindweed too you know bindweed is really something everybody struggles with so i don't know if there's a single solution to actually solving that problem i have asked this question many times as well because i have rampant bindweed in my yard and all the experts that I've talked to have said physical removal. You just have to pull it. You just have to pull it, it out. It just, it is just ever present, mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, in our area. Mm -hmm. um, Hayden, somebody's asking if you could just back up your slides to the, I think the the page that they were wanting was um, the garden in a box page, perhaps. Yeah, let me uh, back them up. Let's Show that slide again. This yeah. one or the plant one? I think it's the garden in a box one. So let's yeah. go there. Uh, and I just will reiterate to folks, if you go to our general website, resourcecentral.org, you will be able to find all the information about all of our programs, including garden in a box, lawn removal, and slow the flow. And you can mm -hmm. see what discounts or things you are available or that you are eligible for based on your water provider. Mm -hmm. All right, yep. let's um, So. I have some thoughts on this, Hayden, but I'll let you take a swing at it first. Amending soil, amending clay soil for water-wise plants. Mm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, like I said, it's Colorado. Everybody has a similar, not super great soil type. So um, using like sheet mulching and stuff like that, where you have some sort of compost where you can eat their till, stir in, mix in, will definitely help with that. I know clay if you know either is either really muddy, it's really tough to dig through. So Doing a physical removal is also good. Using something like a sod cutter where you can remove a couple inches of that and then either reapply new topsoil in there or organic material, organic compost, that kind of stuff um, will really help with that soil amendment. But as far as clay goes, we're kind of all stuck with that um, in this area. So yeah, either amending it by adding, you know, maybe just a couple bags from the local nursery of some topsoil to help, you know, mix that in a little bit and then doing compost your plants will thrive. With that being said, most native drought tolerant plants, they will survive in this type of climate, this type of soil, you know, that, that is what they are meant to do. So I would also take that into consideration that most plants may not need significant amending because they are designed to survive and thrive here. Yeah, that's actually some feedback I've gotten to is if you're buying native plants or similar to native plants, they are used to this type of soil. So I would just um, advise people when, whenever you're purchasing your plants to really pay attention to what type of soil it says they need uh -huh. because it may be very little amending that actually needs to be done. 
All right, Hayden, we have a couple of questions about pine needles as mulch. Do you have any thoughts specifically about pine needles? Yeah, pine needles take a little bit longer to decompose. Um, also, as a mulch, you know, you're, the whole reason for doing a substrate, an inorganic or organic mulch, is really to help with that either moisture retention, wind barrier, or keeping those weeds down. And so with pine needles, if you're only doing pine needles, you're going to have weeds, you're going to have grass grow back, you're going to have stuff like that. But if you're able to mix it in a little bit with other organic or other inorganic mulches, that could benefit, you know, adding certain nutrients to your soil. So pine needles in small quantities mixed in, probably great if you're just like, I have 20 pine trees on my property and I have enough pine needles to cover a whole area. Um, it may not be the outcome that you're looking for. Yeah. All right, so, we, uh, so folks, just so you know, we have a few minutes left. So if you do have any questions, please um, please submit those now. <laughs> and Hayden, it looks like we have a couple of questions specifically about our turf removal program. So one question is, are our fees listed on our website? Yep, so like Nika said, if you go to resourcecentral.org, um, you can look up the lawn replacement program along with slow the flow and garden in a box. But in there, if you select your municipality and water provider, you can walk through the steps and see what you're eligible for and, um, your pricing for certain aspects of our lawn replacement program would be listed there. Great. Fantastic. Yep. So resourcecentral.org and then, you know, looking for the program and under that program there is listing and you know stuff about what type of program it is what it costs stuff like that for across the board for all of the programs yeah and a, a few folks have asked about this um i will reiterate this 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 presentation itself will not be available we will not be sending out the slide deck however we have recorded this and that will be available on youtube is that correct hayden correct yes this will be up on our youtube page resource central and um, you should be able to view it there. Um, there should be a handout or a follow-up email following this webinar probably tomorrow. And in there will be a couple links, one of which will be to the waterwiseyards.org where you can you know, look at other community members and see what that looks like. Um, another one will be to the CSU extension page where you can get other information outside of Resource Central you know, to help you know, broaden your information and what you're receiving. Um, and then another link will be for our lawn replacement how-to, and in there essentially covers everything we've covered in this um, presentation, along with a little bit more um, information and detail. Great. And obviously we have not been able to get to everyone's questions, and folks, there are some questions here that are pretty specific to your yard. Um, maybe not, this is not the best um, area to kind of discuss those. But Hayden, do you have any suggestions for folks if we didn't get to their questions or they think of something after we end this webinar um, where they could go to get those questions answered? Yeah. Um, like I said, that follow-up email will be sent, that how-to page. I would definitely learn more there um, and, you know, see if you can figure out your specific question that way. If you have more pressing, you know, serious lawn replacement questions, I would direct you to lawn replacement at resourcecentral.org um, and a staff member can help you guys out there. Great, fantastic. All right, well, I think the questions have stopped coming in. And so I think that is about it. So Hayden, thank you very much. Um, it was al always great to, to hear this stuff again. <laughs> always great to work with you. Uh, I, again, want to thank the city of Thornton for sponsoring tonight's webinar and just want to thank everyone for joining and spending your evening with us. We truly appreciate it. We do have a number of other webinars coming up. So if you are not already signed up for any of those, please again, go to our website and you can access all those. They are, are all free of charge You can go to as many as you'd like. So Hayden, thanks a bunch. Really appreciate it. That was great information. Yep. Thank you, Nika. And thank you everybody for joining. All right. Have a great evening.